Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Green Chemistry Education Webinar Series hosted by the Green Chemistry Commitment and Beyond Benign. And this week, uh, jointly brought to you by the GC3, the Green Chemistry Commerce Council. My name is Amy Cannon. I'm the founder and executive director of Beyond Benign, a nonprofit organization dedicated to green chemistry education in K-12 through, through higher ed. And we have a co-host who you'll hear from after our, after our um, fabulous panel here of Saskia Van Bergen. She's from the Washington State Department of Ecology. So you'll hear from her as well. And she's also representing the GC3 today. So this webinar is designed, this webinar series is designed to highlight relevant topics in green chemistry education for faculty and students who are looking to adopt green chemistry in their courses and programs. So as if, if you've joined our webinars before, as a, a reminder, this webinar is, is being broadcast live and we're recording this session. So all attendees are in listen-only mode and all lines are muted. If you have a question, then please type it right there into your question or chat box right on your control panel. And um, we will have a look and answer as many questions, get through as many questions as we can after the, the panel pre presents. Um, we do have some supporting documents, such as the power pre presentation slides that you'll see that are, are listed there as a handout that you can find in your control panel there on the right as well. Um, in any supporting documents, um, in these supporting documents and the recording will also be posted um, on our webinars page that you can find here as well. So, um, for those of you who participate in social media, please um, connect with us on Twitter or connect with GC3 on Twitter as well. Um, we would love to hear some live tweeting going on during the webinar. Um, so please connect with us both on, uh, you can see our Twitter and our Facebook links right there. You'll also find these again in the supporting documents in the PDF. So thank you so much for joining in and for taking part in the conversation. This webinar is being brought to you as part of the Green Chemistry Commitment Program, which is a consortium program aimed at transforming chemistry education, expanding the community of green chemistry practitioners, growing departmental resources, improving connections to industry, and affecting systemic change in chemistry education. The program is a voluntary flexible program for adopting green chemistry student learning objectives and for promoting the work that is being done in academia um, and for, that can serve as models for other institutions to get involved with green chemistry. So you can find more information right on our website here, or you can also contact um, me, Amy Cannon, directly, or Derek Ward, our higher ed program manager. Okay, so today we're very excited to feature three fabulous speakers. We're gonna we're gonna go through a panel here, and I'm not gonna um, you know spend too much time introducing them because that's a part of part of this conversation here, part of the webinar, is that we're gonna hear from them about their career paths and their pers perspectives. Um, so we have today Dr. Christoph Crum, co-founder and CEO of Ceronix Renewables. We have Linda Sedlowicz, President and CEO of Schulke Inc., and Maureen Kavanaugh, Senior Technical Manager for 3M's Industrial Min Mineral Products Division. So we're going to go through and hear from each of them directly, and we're going to start off with Christoph. So we're going to hand the controls right over to you to get us going. All right. Well, thank you very much, and and thank you to uh, Beyond Benign and the uh, Green Chemistry and Commerce Council for for having me on this webinar. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about um, sort of my career and how it started. Um, I started on the academic side of green chemistry and um, transitioned over into um, into uh, starting a business out of uh, my research project. Um, and uh, my background is entirely in chemical engineering um, with a, a bachelor's degree from the University of Washington um, and a PhD from the University of Minnesota. Um, and, and for the majority of that, I knew I wanted to pursue a career in sustainable chemistry of some sort, um, but I wasn't sure exactly how that would look. Um, and so I'll share a little bit about uh, my journey into figuring that out and, and where I am today and, and how that grew. Um, 
but uh, I guess coming out of my undergraduate education, um, most of the jobs I found didn't really focus specifically on sort of the research aspect uh, that I was interested in in sustainable chemistry. Um, and, and that led me to pursuing uh, graduate research at the University of Minnesota. Um, and in grad school, I really enjoyed the, the research process. Uh, I, I loved my project um, and I loved being able to work on developing something entirely new. Um, but as, as many who have been in, in research uh, can attest to, uh, publishing papers was, was challenging and ultimately it wasn't exactly what motivated me. Uh, I wanted to be able to take these ideas and implement them and, and actually um, develop them to, to something that consumers can use. Um, and right around that time, I began to pursue some entrepreneurial coursework, um, which is where I started to think about my research in more of an entrepreneurial framework and, and which ultimately led me to forming uh, my company, Ceronics Renewables. Um, but I'll back up a little bit and I'll, I'll share a little bit about um, what my research project was and, and kind of how I got towards even that concept of starting a company from that. Um, so uh, the first three quarters of my grad school work was actually in biofuels research um, and I, I really enjoyed it, um, but it was a very fundamental project. Um, I think the, the results of it were, were super important, um, but I didn't ultimately see it uh, translating into something that um, a consumer would see uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, but toward the end of uh, my work, I started to work on uh, a project um, in the renewable chemical space um, where we wanted to make existing petrochemical surfactants, um, this molecule shown on, on the left of the slide here, um, but from plants instead of petroleum. Uh, and surfactants are really ubiquitous molecules. They're used in uh, detergents and cleaners like Tide, for example. Um, they're used in agricultural products, oil recovery, coatings, paints, inks, you name it. Um, all of these different uh, surfactant molecules, different structural iterations of them can be applied in different areas. Um, and the original research questions we set out to uh, was, can we make these existing petrochemical surfactants, but from plants instead of petroleum? Um, and along the way, um, we sort of stumbled across something interesting. Uh, when we decided to uh, test one of the intermediate molecules that, that we were making. And so we came, we, we originally came away with a way to make this petrochemical molecule, um, but we made instead this, uh, this other molecule you see below it. It looks structurally very similar, um, but we decided to test its properties. Um, and in many ways it performed very similarly to the petrochemical one. Um, but it differentiated itself in one major way, and that was in the hard water tolerance of it. So when you use a surfactant in water and there's calcium present, um, typically what will happen is the calcium will sort of bind to the surfactant. It'll, it'll inactivate it. So if you've ever maybe shampooed your hair in hard water conditions, the shampoo won't foam. Um, that's because of this problem. So then on the right, you can see here, uh, we had this little cuvette with the Minnesota logo in the background, uh, and we started increasing the calcium concentration. So on the on the top molecule, you can see at, at 30 parts per million, it's clear. At 230 parts per million, you start to get this opaque uh, white solution. So you're starting to form this, this solid material. And at 10,000 parts per million, it looks like a blizzard in there with, with snowflakes of, of surfactant floating around. Well, as it turned out, that wasn't the problem uh, with, with the molecule that we were making. It was incredibly stable and, and functioned well and, and maintained this clear solution. Um, and so I'm presenting all of this to you um, because this is where I originally started to see how this could differentiate itself as a new technology in that space. Um, and, and ultimately also, um, began to think about the applications and, and, and how this molecule could potentially make an impact on one of those uh, uh, application spaces that I showed previously. Um, and so I mentioned I took some uh, entrepreneurial coursework, but, but first we went and we filed patents with the University of Minnesota. Um, and right around that time also started pursuing the startup coursework. Um, and 
this was through the management school at the University of Minnesota, but it was very oriented towards people like me who had uh, zero business background, um, but maybe a cool idea or some scientific concept that we wanted to explore in greater detail. Um, and so that really sort of kickstarted the idea of starting to find an application for the technology. Um, what, how did this technical uh, idea or, or breakthrough translate into something that a customer might care about? Um, and so they kind of kick you out the door there and, and send you out to actually talk to potential customers in your space. Those could be people who buy a bottle of laundry detergent off a shelf or the people who actually mix the bottle of laundry detergent um, in the factory. Um, you name it, you, you go and talk to them and you learn about their problems and so on. Um, and this entrepreneurial coursework was sort of the initial uh, uh, appetizer or taste test of that uh, of that concept. Um, and from there, uh, applied to a program through the National Science Foundation called i um, And that's basically an innovation accelerator that pushes you through this same concept. Um, they call it the lean startup methodology, but basically you try to figure out as fast as possible and as cheaply as possible, who's gonna buy your product, why would they buy it, um, what, pro what specific problems are you solving, um, and and so on and so that's where i started to think about this concept of okay well we have this very calcium tolerant surfactant but what does that mean to someone who uses a laundry detergent do they care or is it the person uh, the person that's mixing the bottle of laundry detergent itself um you know how can we make it easier for a formulator to uh to put together a laundry detergent and and what does this technical uh innovation mean for them so a lot of questions to answer and a lot of people to talk to and, and learn from, but that was a, a very helpful uh, um, practice to go through to, to learn more about what we were doing. Um, and as we sort of refined that, um, I, I moved on toward uh, applying for what are called SBIR grants, which stands for Small Business Innovation and Research. Um, and those are sort of uh, commercialization uh, translational grants that fund you to to take what you know is is shown in an academic setting to be a potentially promising technology and actually develop a proof of concept a prototype of some kind and um, show that you can translate this into a business model that works and so i'd say that's sort of the next step from this i -Corps program um, you can you can actually get funding to to start a company and to take this out of an academic setting and really start pursuing it in a commercial way. Uh, and and this is where I officially started Ceronics Renewables. It was actually it, all of these things kind of blend together, but um, this is where I officially uh, finished up my PhD as fast as I could, um, defended. Uh, I think it was like within two weeks or something like that, and. Um, moved on toward towards working under these grants um, and since then we've been really lucky and and fortunate to um, get some follow-on grants um, to a total of about 1.3 million dollars um, and this is what's called non-dilutive funding which has been really great for us because it, it means that no one is taking a stake in the company but it is government funded research to do a specific commercialization task um, that's going to benefit the United States in some way. That's sort of the, the motivation for these uh, grant agencies to fund that. Um, and that's what we've been operating the company off entirely since then, um, is, is these grant funds, and then more recently, um, starting to build some partnerships with other groups. Um, and, and the grant funds have been sort of an excellent outlet for us to make some contacts um, with good research agencies and, and come up with ideas to continue to develop our technology. Um, and, and one of those is with Los Alamos National Lab um, and the other is with the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. They have a process intensification institute called RAPID and that's kind of uh, for the, the, the concept of scaling up the technology. Um, and so all of these have sort of progressed into where the company is today in terms of uh, uh, developing this this chemical technology. We're still uh, pre-sales at this point and doing a lot of technical development on our side. 
Um, it, the company has existed for about two years now, um, and uh, and hopefully um, we'll be able to take this technology to uh, a market application with minimal additional uh, investment. Um, so it, this all ties back to sustainability um, in the sense uh, that when I was pursuing this as a graduate project, um, this sort of interesting technical idea or concept of this hard water tolerance kind of sent it down a path of pursuing it in a more entrepreneurial framework um, in that I, I started to think about some of the applications of, of the technology um, and ultimately how it could improve upon what exists now. Um, I think one of the really great things about sustainable chemistry is we have entirely different feedstocks and, and um, resources available that can really improve upon uh, things that exist now. And, and there are ways to do this in an economic way um, that'll be cheap enough to, to you know, have a widespread implementation and still make a big impact. Um, and I think some of the things that I've, I've learned from that is, is to try to learn as much as you can up front. Um, I think um, some of the most exciting things are to just dive into a new area. You know, I didn't really know about detergents and cleaners when I was working on renewable chemistry, but uh, you kind of go down this pigeonhole and learn a ton and, and you're able to um, find out a lot about those uh, areas. Um, and as obvious as it sounds, be open to change and ask questions. Um, that's really important in a, in a renewable and sustainable chemistry area because you are pursuing, you know, the forefront of research and you have an, an opportunity to, to make a big impact. But there are a lot of people that, that know a lot of things uh, out there. And if you talk to them, uh, you're going to get a lot of help, um, especially uh, in an academic setting. Uh, people are so happy to help students. Um, and if you go to a conference, um, you can approach almost anyone, and it's amazing how much they're willing to help you. I had many fantastic one to two hour conversations with people at, at conferences who basically just are happy to spill their knowledge about, um, you know, one specific area. And, and that's a huge help uh, as a startup. It's, it's you know, basically free consulting. Uh, and so that, that was uh, very valuable for us. Um, and then in an academic setting, uh, it's important to think about the business side early on. So you have a research project or, or some sort of project that you're doing. Um, what's the impact of it? Who's going to use it? Um, and and uh, how is that going to affect what they do? Um, I think oftentimes we think of sustainability as this, this important um, all-encompassing concept, but um, there are uh, business aspects to it, too, that um, you, you don't always think about. Non-obvious ways that sustainability can improve people's work or make it easier for what they do. Um, like I said, you know, there, we, have, we have this whole set of chemistry knowledge and, and resources available. Um, it's just a matter of finding out how we can apply it to making people's lives easier, basically. Um, and that's kind of why I see as sustainability and, and startups as being a great match because um, really what it is is taking a, uh, a new idea and, and translating it uh, into a concept that can improve people's lives. And I think that's uh, hugely motivating and, and something that I enjoy uh, doing day in and day out. Um, so hopefully you've sort of gotten a, an idea of, of what it's or what my career path has been like, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Um, but uh, thank you again to the organizers. Thank you, Christoph. That was wonderful. I love that. I love that story. Um, we're now going to hand over the controls to Linda. So, Linda, you should see that pop up right now. And again, as a reminder, um, please do type in any questions um, into your question box anytime, and we'll be taking the questions after the three presenters. Okay, Linda? I almost forgot to come off a of mute. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, uh, all of you out there who are listening. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, and, and I was a little surprised to get invited at first because I do have a more traditional 
traditional business background, I guess, um, that really isn't grounded so much in green chemistry. But it, when you really think about it, I do uh, function in that in that area now. Um, and bear with me, we'll be getting to that. Um, my background, I'm starting a little bit earlier with my background than Christoph did. Um, I always looked up to my dad, well, little girls do. My dad started as a pressman uh, working on printing presses and worked his way up into sales and then became technical support for the company that he worked for that was selling printing plates and chemicals. And he was well respected and a very uh, useful employee. Uh, and I always appreciated that. I always found that uh, very interesting about my dad and respected him for that because he was very respected amongst his peers. It didn't dawn on me till many years later that I took a similar path that he did. Um, started off school as a math and science uh, student. For the most part, my favorite topics were math and science. And my favorite cooking uh, hobby was cooking. And that doesn't sound like much, but that is what got me my first job in chemistry. I went to Cook College, uh, Rutgers University in New Jersey. I entered as a pre-vet major. My goal in life was to be a veterinarian for large cats at zoos. And after about one semester, I realized that it is more difficult in the United States to become a veterinarian than it is to become a human doctor because we have fewer veterinary schools and decided to change my major to economics where I figured I'd get a job getting out of school. And my interest there lied mainly in accounting and marketing. I graduated with a BS in economics from Cook College. But my summer job throughout all of this was as a quality control lab technician for the company my dad worked for. And I think I got the job because I was the only one of the employees' kids that had any science background. So I spent my summers splashing around in printing plate chemicals and testing printing plates and running printing presses. I went for my first job out of college. I became a financial analyst for a company called Okite Products. They made cleaning chemicals uh, for industrial cleaning. and floor polishes, things like that. And what I really learned in this job is I really was much happier in a lab. My boss was one that would hover over my shoulder. And while I liked playing with the numbers, it wasn't my thing. And I decided to quit that job and crawl back into a lab where I was safe and happy and warm until I decided what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. So I found this company called J.B. Williams. They no longer exist. They made personal care items, body lotions, aftershaves, that type of thing. And I became a lab technician in their R&D lab. And this is the job that I got because I could cook. I had a little bit of science background and I could cook. And the industry, the cosmetic industry, personal care industry, basically refers to their chemistry as cookbook chemistry. Making these creams and lotions, shampoos, you follow an ingredient list like you would putting together a stew. And so it came fairly naturally to me, but I did have a lot of help. There were some wonderful people that I worked with and I was the kid in the lab and they all wanted to help. They all wanted to show me how to do things, how to do things better and to teach me their profession. And it's wonderful to be able to take advice for that. I've been blessed having some very helpful people around me throughout my career. In doing this, I also took some night classes. I went back to school for some more chemistry, worked myself up from lab technician to junior chemist, and then J.B. Williams was sold. And the company that bought them, Beecham Products, at the time um, would have hired me. They wanted to put me into a dentifrice lab, and I really had no desire to stripe Aquafresh for the rest of my life, so I went looking for another job. And I found a company called Van Dyke and Company. Uh, they are now a division of Ashland. I uh, went in there as a junior chemist in the applications lab. And again, this was a company that made raw materials for personal care formulation. 
sunscreens, emollients, emulsifiers. And so I was doing basically what I did at J.B. Williams, but in a slighter, slightly different way. I was taking the chemistries that Van Dyke and company came up with, their sunscreens, their emulsifiers, and forming them, formulating them into products that the sales team could then take around to show their customers, to show how the products worked. In doing this also, I went back for some continuing education classes, which I really think give you more of a real world training into what you're doing. It's great to have the chemistry background, but what you're learning in school doesn't necessarily help you significantly when you're trying to put together an emulsion. So I did that. I worked my way up to uh, junior chemist, excuse me, to chemist. And then after a while, I felt like I was reinventing the wheel. We would get a request for a formulation for a shampoo. I could go back to any one of a number of notebooks and pull out a shampoo, tweak it a little bit, and send it back out. What I really liked was being on the phone with customers, trying to help them formulate their products, trying to decide which product was best for them and how best to use it. And so I wanted to go into sales. I wanted more human contact, and that wasn't available to me at Van Dyke. So I went to a company that used to supply us with preservatives. Went to a company called Sutton Laboratories, who again became part of ISP and again became part of Ashland. And I went in as a sales representative. What I found out in that is that when you're trying to sell something to someone, knowing what they do and how they do it in detail is very, very helpful. So I could walk into a laboratory where they were formulating a sunscreen and they were having a problem. It wasn't stable or it was failing for um, preservative efficacy. And I could see what was going wrong with their formula because i had done that for seven years prior. I had the hands-on experience, and that goes a long way when you're trying to sell a product and when you're trying to build a relationship with a customer. But what I liked most about the job was figuring out how to fix something. When a customer had a problem, that I could come in and then help them find a solution. And that's what I like to do. And that moved me into a more of a technical support position and then eventually into a marketing position all within Sutton. And it was here that I found my mentor. Um, my mentor, Dave Steinberg, is a well-known um, expert in personal care, in personal care preserver preservation in particular. And he basically took me under his wing and taught me what he knew. And when it came time for me to leave Sutton, it was David that got me my next two jobs. He was consulting for a company called Gatsisse. They're a French company that, again, makes specialty chemistries for uh, personal care and some pharmaceutical applications. And I became their first marketing manager for the US. It's a French corporation, had an office in New Jersey, they hadn't had their own marketing or sales team up until the point that I joined them. And this was their venture into becoming a larger company. And I worked there for a while. Uh, they do also a lot of natural products, which at the time was just becoming a very popular. And they had some emulsifiers made from um, natural sources. They had a specifically a beeswax derivative that was a beautiful product, my favorite product while I was working there, but they also do active products, anti-acne, anti-aging, uh, whitening, those types of things based on natural sources, mainly plant-based. So the industry, the personal care industry has for many years been looking for effective, naturally based materials, but to be natural alone is not good enough. It has to also be effective because you're up against the synthetic materials. 
Now, after a while, I had some disagreements with management and they moved me into a technical sales position, I think just to get me out of the office, at which point I started looking for another job. And again, Dave Steinberg came to my rescue and he was consulting for Schulke Meyer GmbH in Germany. It's the parent company to the one I currently am president for the US. They do preservatives for a variety of different applications and had no offices in the US at the time and were looking for somebody to start uh, their business in the US. So when I came on board, it was me. I uh, had the backing of a larger company, which un made things a little easier for me than for Christoph. I didn't have to go looking for support and input, uh, had that already. But it was just me trying to expand this product line across the US. So I hired some distribution and I worked as technical support and I worked as sales. And through the years, I've built the company up underneath me to where I'm doing less of the hands-on day to day and starting to get back to some of my education in the fact that I'm doing more marketing, in the fact that I'm doing the standard boss type stuff where I'm looking at uh, profit and loss statements and balance sheets and budgeting and all that. So the, the education has now gotten back to me, but I did this by knowing the industry, coming up through the industry, and I still got people that call me directly and ask me for answers to their problems. So through it all, uh, I've had to learn new skills. I've had to listen to people. Again, my mentor was extremely helpful. And never discount the value of anything you learn because it will come back at some point. So. It all started with science, it moved into math and business and back into science and then back into math and business for me. So it's amazing how little things you pick up along the way become very valuable down the line. So you're wondering how all of this relates to green chemistry. And it all basically does. All of these functions are present in the green chemistry world and most industries are looking for natural and sustainable alternatives to synthetics that are out there. Schilke is got a big project on natural preservatives. So we are looking for that. We're part of the Green Chemistry Council sponsors for their preservative challenge. So we're actively looking in that area. We also have a emphasis on sustainability. We're a German company, so we're very conscious of how we affect the environment and try very hard, even if we're using more traditional petrochemical methods and, and chemistries, we try to work with them in as sustainable as a manner as possible. So you'll find this in personal care, you'll find it in, in fuel oil and gas, you'll find it in automotives, all of these industries are looking for sustainable alternatives to what they're currently using. And so many of these companies have teams that are devoted to green chemistry or departments focusing on sustainability. So it's more of a traditional company, but they have this focus within them. As I mentioned, Green chemistry, naturals in personal care, which is the industry I'm involved in, it's the fastest growing segment of that market. Most suppliers of raw materials in this field are looking for green alternatives. We've been talking for years about cradle to grave. I've seen some presentations on cradle to cradle where they start with the initial uh, ingredients for the chemistries or the chemistry themselves and follow the process through to where it's now being reused, recycled, or renewed in some way and follow the cycle back again. So most of these industries are trying to be as green as they can, even if they're a more traditional industry. 
I just wanted to show you a couple of uh, advertisements, excuse me, um, articles that I've seen recently. I get a bunch of industry newsletters. These three came from the same newsletter, but on different days during the course of a week. And there were a lot more. I only picked three. So it's constant, particularly in personal care, that we're seeing green chemistry being in, in the front of people's minds. So my tips, and there'll be a lot of similarities, I think, here between me and Christoph, and I think you'll find the same thing with Maureen. Uh, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Get started at the bottom. It's fine. You don't have to start your own company from the very beginning. You can start somewhere else and work your way up. It takes longer, but it gives you an understanding, a deeper understanding of what you're doing, what your customers are doing, what the industry is doing. Follow your interests. You'll be happier in the long run. You'll find that one thing leads to another, and that should move you along your career path. I didn't start my career thinking I would end up where, I'm, where I am. I just followed what was interesting to me. And I don't think I've taken too many wrong turns in doing that. And accept help from others. A lot of people are afraid to ask questions, ask for help. You'll find people around you want to help you in your job, uh, in your schoolwork. You can learn a lot from people, from all sorts of people. And it's extremely valuable. If somebody offers themselves to you as a mentor, grab on with both hands because they can be of incredible value to you in the long run. It's something you should strive for yourself with people below you. It's something that you can look for people around you to help you. But it, it's a very important part of your career if you can find someone that is willing to give you that kind of time and that kind of value. And that's pretty much me. So uh, I'll turn it back over to the organizers. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Linda. I love I love your career path. I love your story. Um, and I love how we've just had two two different um, two different views on these careers. So that's fantastic. We're going to make a transition over to Maureen at 3M for our final presenter today. So Maureen, you should see that pop up for you. Perfect. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Christoph and Linda, great stories as you continue also on your journey. And those of you online, as you start your journey, welcome um, as we uh, get into the next segment here. Does it look like you have uh, control there, Maureen? Nope, I'm not. Let's see here. Oh, there we there, go. There Perfect. Looks now like it is. Okay, great. So great. I'm excited to talk to you today about green chemistry careers in industry. Uh, today, I will give you an overview of my career at 3M. So I've been here 18 years. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about my professional experience and also my passion because that really has drove uh, my decisions uh, to change uh, different directions in my career. Uh, and lastly, I'll leave you with some tips that have been helpful, not only for me, but a lot of my direct reports as I see them grow uh, their careers. And just as they start out, it is just so fun in reference to uh, them exploring uh, where they're going to. So I wanted to start out today and talk a little bit about 3M uh, in the company uh, that I work for. And at 3M, we have one vision and it's, it's ambitious. Uh, it's very, very ambitious, but we also believe it's attainable. Uh, not just because of what we do, but because of how we do it. Uh, we're very rooted in this scientific exploration and discovery. Uh, there's no boundaries. We continue to work with divisions and the corporate research lab. And we believe that every problem really has a solution to it. And so uh, as 
we talk about who we are in improving lives since 1902. I just want to point out a few things that have been really the driver for me, not only coming to 3M, but have just led me to, to stay here for 18 years because it's been an exciting adventure. Uh, this 15% culture uh, has been, it's a core belief at 3M. Uh, it's, a, it's about creativity and the, the freedom to be a scientist. And we encourage people to use uh, this time and take our resources and build unique teams and to follow your insight uh, in the pursuit of solving a problem. And this could be a world problem. Uh, we're a, a team of 89,000 uh, employees globally. Uh, so it's a fun team. You never know when you're gonna be on the phone uh, at what time of the day. Uh, we've also, uh, what I find amazing is 300,000 plus hours volunteered by 3Mers in 2015 alone. Uh, this is just a very passionate company uh, for the science and the people. And then I think another exciting fact for 3M is this 2.1 million. And so what does that mean? That means 2 point million tons of air, water, and waste pollution over the last 40 years we've prevented. And so 3M has always been about green chemistry in a different way, and we call it Pollution Prevention Pays Program. Uh, so, and as I talk a little bit more about our sustainability vision, uh, it's really important that this is rooted in our culture uh, even before sustainability was even the word uh, that was used out in uh, the world. And so another fun fact that I love to share is uh, this 10 feet. Uh, you rarely are rarely more than 10 feet away from 3M science. So if you look around, you have your cell phones. Uh, there's 3M technology in our computers, our cell phones, everything from our pressure sensitive adhesive to our film technology. Uh, and so really cool things. So uh, it, it could be bandages or other things. And then we also service over 200 uh, different countries for our customers. So those are just little facts about 3M. Um, and I want to dive right into, you know, where my passion lies about these global challenges that we do have. At 3M, we look at sustainability, which is encompassing of not only the raw materials, but energy and climate and water and health and safety and education and development. And as the population continues to grow and we get these mega cities, you know, particularly in emerging economies, it's important that we must have technology to address and ensure that people across the globe can actually lead healthy and fulfilling lives. And so uh, 3M Innovation really aims to tackle uh, these world most pressing areas of concerns. Uh, and so I was actually uh, part of a team uh, that developed a lot of the input in the the feed that went into uh, the raw materials and the water portion of these global challenges. And it's fun to work across the boundaries of having chemists in there with a polymer scientist and also our environmental people. So that's just a little bit about 3M. And so let's dive into a, a little bit about myself and my education. And so I wanna start out by talking about how important your degree is for getting your first job and it sets you off for a successful career. Uh, my chemistry degree was a key for starting my position at 3M uh, as a chemist uh, in what was our pharmaceutical division at the time. And as I was in my role, my passion was really about reducing the amount of steps to make the molecule or using less solvent. Those were things that just challenged me day in and day out but there was also this other passion inside of me uh, that went on to pursue a master's uh, in management. And it was really about the people. And so while I was pursuing this degree, I was still accomplishing you know, many things in the patent world, uh, especially in the immune response modifiers. Uh, these are, are drug molecules that were being developed when I was in pharmaceuticals. And so as I span my career even out further, 
with the divestiture of our pharmaceutical business, I started to work in the area of renewable materials and pressure sensitive adhesives. And my passion really continued to grow more about the sustainability aspect, but also uh, went on to building and leading, how do I build and lead these effective teams? And so not only encompassing the hands-on bench work, but also that educational piece to help uh, connect all the things for me. And so as I talk a little bit about my professional experience uh, at 3M, I also want to tie it back to some of my experience prior to 3M, which I believe really got me my current position that I'm in at 3M. So you never know when all of these things are going to tie back into your next position. Uh, you know, I had started out in inside sales uh, before I went back to school and so worked with commercial contractors in the lumber industry. And so my current role in industrial mineral products division is we make roofing granules. We put ceramic coatings on them and we sell them into the asphalt roofing industry. And so you're probably thinking, okay, sustainability, green chemistry, how does that fit in with a roofing granule? And, and so I'll talk a little bit about that on my next slide, so I'll, I'll leave you hanging. Um, but I, I'm convinced that some of my experience and previous experience in that commercial industry, uh, in the lumber industry, dealing with commercial contractors played a bigger role uh, in my current position. And then also those other little things you do as side projects. Uh, you know, one of my side projects was general contracting in my own house, so really understood you know, how we go through the building process. And so I'm convinced also that part of that experience really got me my current position. You know, I've held multiple positions at 3M, spanning 13 years at, on the bench as a chemist. I will say I like chemistry, but I love polymer chemistry better. Um, and so it's, it's that partnership with a team uh, that really uh, drove my success but also uh, this professional involvement also grew what I knew. Uh, you know, the Center for Sustainable Polymers at the University of Minnesota, you know, being on that industrial uh, advisory board and being part of the GC3 uh, has really opened my eyes to the consumer part of things and really understanding what is driving the consumer and how we can make a, a better world for different types of feedstocks that, that may be there. Uh, and also my internal passion was to get a green chemistry chapter uh, organized within 3M. So I'm a founding member uh, for our green chemistry chapter. Uh, I chaired this particular team to get us up and running. And so that whole professional uh, experience also plays a role into my passion. My passion is really around sustainability. And when I talk about sustainability, I, I encompass green chemistry and, and solventless processes and, and how do we get to a world with using less catalysts and less steps in our synthesis or renewable feedstocks. And so these are some of the cool things that we're thinking about at 3M. Um, so I've been part of uh, you know, newly on board uh, for our roofing granule business. And, and we have what they call cool roofing granules. And so this helps to reflect the heat. So if you think of mega cities growing into the future, is you're really trying to decrease the effects of these urban heat islands while also still being affordable to the customer. So our roofing granules that would go into an asphalt shingle on somebody's roof can help cool communities that are in these mega cities uh, that, that have these increased uh, urban heat islands. And so some of the other fun things that I have found uh, that I've worked on are plant-based adhesives. So not only identifying the source that a plant can give you for uh, a, a chemical compound or a renewable feedstock, but what do I do with it when I get it? And then how do I think about it in a volume perspective? Is there actually enough of that plant to be able to produce what I need for my end product? And so those are two key things that I just highlighted in my career that I think uh, from a sustainability uh, in that passion to drive technology for the future. And so I just wanna touch 
is this is kind of how I see my career is my education is a piece of it and, and that's how I got my first job and to continue to build off of that education but also your professional experience. Are you thinking about how am I going to get my next job or are you just having fun and driving towards that passion and that that's kind of me is my research has always been about this passion around sustainability no matter what I, I've been in, uh, it's inside of me and I can't change it. And so I continue to drive towards that. So if I can leave you guys with any tips about education and professional experience and sustainability or green chemistry, whatever your passion is, is be passionate about what you are doing because the more passionate you are, you're gonna be more engaged and you're gonna be a successful employee. And whatever you're gonna do, become an expert. Uh, and, and if you're not passionate about it, find something else that you're passionate about. And key things that people forget about is communication, is you have to learn how to sell your technology, because if you can't sell your technology, people are not gonna know what you're doing or what you're trying to develop. And so that, that education piece will get you in the door but consider all these other pieces of external organizations and networks and coaching others. Uh, this is really where you are gonna have success. And, and lastly, just be passionate about what you're doing because it will drive your career uh, to endless, uh, endless jobs that, that you'll be passionate about. So with that, I'll turn that back over to the organizers and I wanna thank everybody for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Maureen. I love that passion. I love all of these stories. This is this has been fantastic. Um, I should have, let me see. Do I have controls? I do. Wonderful. Okay. Um, we uh, I'm going to invite Saskia to to join me here. We're going to we're going to field some questions here and um, we do have some questions that have come into our control panel here. There's still time, so please do type them into your chat box there if you have questions that you'd like to ask these panelists as well. Um, and Saskia and I will get to as many as we can. And then we're also going to mention some green chemistry student resources for the students um, that are in attendance and also for the faculty to help um, you know, point their students to some of these resources as well. Great. So, um, yeah. f first question for Christoph: At what point did you realize there was a business opportunity with your research, and how did you recognize that opportunity? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, I I think the point um, I, I think I think two things actually came together there. Um, the the first was sort of on the technical side um, when we really found this sort of new to the world or differentiated uh, uh, hard water stability thing. That's where we, we thought, okay, we really have something here. Um, and sort of simultaneously, um, I had already been interested a little bit in entrepreneurship and I, I had started to you know, attend some sort of uh, evening sessions and, and workshops and stuff on the concept. Um, and those two things sort of came together into this idea of, okay, well, you, you have this technical concept now, how can you translate it into something that people care about? So, you know, I started to think a little bit about, you know, what does this hard water stability mean? Um, who is it going to affect? Um, and, and as it turns out, most people don't really think about what is, is in their laundry detergent formulation. Um, but uh, formulators of that uh, think about it a lot. Um, and, and they have a lot of very specific needs and a, a lot of problems that can be solved. Um, and so sort of starting to dig down at those problems is is where I started to think that there was there was something that we had there and something that we could develop. Um, but it's you know it's not a it's not a one day to the next kind of thing. Um, it's just a matter of kind of maintaining an open perspective of what you're doing um, and always thinking about the application. Um, I think at, at the expense of being too long winded here, but I think, as researchers, sometimes we're, we're too quick to just say, well, you know, this, this green chemistry concept has an application in this market area, and here's the market size. But thinking specifically about 
what is that application? What what problem are you solving, and and why is someone going to care about it? Um, and that's where you really get, I, I think, the really interesting and, and nitty gritty details of of technology and business. That's wonderful. Um, I'll uh, we've got the next question for Linda. It seems that your career path led you to sustainability or and or sustainable products. Do you see sustainability as an advantage with your experience in different types of companies? Have you found this to be an advantage? Well, I think all industry is moving that way. And if you can show as your company that you are invested in this and working towards sustainability and green, it plays well to sell your product. It plays well to sell the company because the people that I'm selling to are also interested in this. So I think it is an advantage for companies to be working towards this because that's what people want. That's what the consumer wants. And so that's what the people who make the consumer products want and the people who sell the consumer products want. And so if you can sell a green story, a true green story, not just make something up, but if there are green and sustainable advantages to your products, even again, if they're more traditional products, and you can say, well, here is our company and we're now using 50% less electricity. And I know with Shulky, we have our own water plants in the facility. So our wastewater is actually cleaner than the water that comes into us to be used. And I think that's a great thing for a company to promote and to um, advertise and, and, and to use as, as something that they can be very proud of. Not as long-winded as, as Christoph's answer. No. <laughs> Great. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> uh, next question for Maureen. So how did you get into sustainability and where did that passion come from? So for myself, I mean, it, it has just been, uh, you know, ever since I, I started working is how do I reduce the waste even at home? So um, you know, when I did my education, there was no formal green chemistry classes and, and those types of things. And so I was always challenging, you know, what the norm was. It was awkward to, to put stuff into recycling when I was growing and now it's kind of the norm. And so I, I feel that it's always just been a, a driver and a passion within me to walk around and see all this waste all over the ground. and. And how do we change that for future generations? And so that's kind of where my passion has lied. I grew up in the city and St. Paul was a, not really a, a small city, but now we're starting to see smog here uh, within you know, St. Paul. And so uh, it's just been always a driver for me. That's wonderful, I love that. Um, Okay, the next the next one we've got is for Christoph, and we are going to take this just a few minutes after to try to address all the questions here. So bear with us, and if you can't stay on, then please do jump in to the recording, and you can skip to the end to hear the hear the last uh, burning questions here. So for Christoph, can you comment on the economics of your product? Are there challenges competing with petrochemicals? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> That is that is a big question, um, and and it's something that is is obviously on uh, on our minds all the time. Um, inherently, um, it, you know, it's it's challenging to compete with petrochemicals when you're you're you know you you can basically take things out of the ground for free and and turn them into products. Um, however, I think that that sort of concept is changing a lot, um, and I think it's important to think about um, the products that we make. Um, not just in a head-to-head -head price comparison, but, uh, you know, what's the value to the person who's going to use it? Um, and so in this case, it's not just substituting one surfactant for another. It's saying, okay, well, here's a surfactant, but it has this additional uh, benefit. And as it turns out, that can make it easier for a formulator to maybe remove some other components of their formulation. 
Um, and, and ultimately, even if you maybe have, let's say, a, a more expensive chemical, um, the net gain to that formulator uh, could be cheaper. Um, and so I think it's important to think about green chemistry in a more, I guess, holistic way uh, and, and not just think of things as drop-in replacements um, because there is really an opportunity to um, make something new and, and better um, and ultimately, I think, compete on a, a price basis as well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, question for Linda. What qualities in addition to expertise would you recommend when looking for a mentor? And what advice do you have to get the most out of the relationship? Well, uh, my event in, excuse me, my mentor found me. Uh, I didn't really go looking for him. He was my boss. Uh, but expertise is definitely one of them. They've got to be obviously willing to teach. Uh, my mentor also taught, taught continuing aid classes. Um, they, they have to have, obviously, if they're going to be your mentor, they have to have an interest in growing your career and seeing you move ahead. Um, so, again, I didn't go looking for this. It kind of found me, as I think most of my career did. But if you've got someone who really takes an interest in you and in growing your career and in teaching you what they know about what they do, then that's who you grab onto. And they can be a very helpful resource um, and a good friend, and in a lot of cases, can help move your career forward. I think that's wonderful. Wonderful advice. Um, okay, this is we're gonna, this is going to be the last question, and what we're going to do is email out the the green chemistry student resources section to all the attendees. Um, so, last question for Maureen. Have you found um, not having a PhD in chemistry or a comparable field being a disadvantage in your career or limiting? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I will have to say, uh, you know, at the level I'm at right now, I, I don't feel I, I'm limited. I think I don't listen to the chatter that other, everybody says to you, well, you don't have a PhD, you don't have a PhD, because if I had a dollar for every time somebody had said that to me, I probably wouldn't be, I probably wouldn't be at 3M if I would have collected those dollars along the way. And so we continue to strive that, uh, you know, education is a plus and a PhD does get you very far. Uh, within any career. I, I'm not going to deny that there. There has been many, many challenges uh, with not having a PhD uh, for certain roles. And so I've always uh, just overcome those odds with hard work, educating myself along the way. And so I think that's a key to your success. I, I think that um, I, I didn't want to do a PhD, and I have absolutely no regrets, even though I know that I'll probably hear it probably a thousand more times before I retire in my lifetime, but I'm okay with that. Um, so, you know, if, if I have to give people advice in reference to should I do a PhD or not, I always say go out and search people who have gotten a bachelor's degree and a PhD and decide internally where is the passion that you need to be and what are the obstacles that you have to overcome? Uh, and if it's uh, that path of, no, I don't want to do a PhD, you still will be very successful. I think that's great advice. And that links back, I think, right to Linda's discussion on mentorship. So that's that's perfect. Um, so with that, I think we'll, we'll close and um, we, we will be, again, we'll be support, um, posting these supporting documents and um, recording on the following link here. And you'll also receive a direct link to the recording and supporting documents in your email tomorrow, um, along with some extra slides on some student resources. And I just want to thank our speakers again. I think this was really fantastic to show three different paths and at three different stages of, of careers and from three different backgrounds. 
Um, so you really were fantastic and shared some really great insights and perspectives. So thank you so much to Christoph, Linda, and Maureen. Um, and thank you for joining.